Sign up for WinBet Sportsbook at wynnbet.com today using promo code BLUEWIRE to get up to $1,000 toward a risk-free sports bet. Offer subject to change, terms, and conditions at winbet.com. Must be 21 or older and present in the state where playthrough WinBet is available. If you or someone you know has a gambling problem, call 1-800-522-4700. What is crack-a-lackin' Hardwood Knox listeners? I am Dan Valley coming at you once more without my fantabulous co-host, Adam Frommel. The team look ahead train continues to roll on though, and I'm excited to get to the Cleveland Cavaliers with Justin Rowan. He has been on this podcast a few times before. He is the co-host of the Chase Down Pod, which is officially under the umbrella of the Cleveland Cavaliers Network. Very impressive. Had a great conversation with him. Be sure to follow him on Twitter at Cavzanada. That's at C-A-V-S-A-N-A-D-A. That's at C-A-V-S-A-N-A-D-A. Before we dive into a bunch of interesting Cleveland Cavaliers talk, let me just deliver our usual reminders, please, begs, whatever you want to call it. Remember to rate, review, and subscribe to this podcast wherever you get your podcast. If this is the first time that you're listening, you stumbled on to us by accident, or you just really love the Cleveland Cavaliers, maybe you want to love listen to Justin, maybe you want to hate listen to me, why ever you're here, if this is your first time, please consider throwing us that permanent subscription, whether anyone here uses iTunes or not. So long as you have access, we ask that you head over to iTunes, throw us a five-star rating, write a review. It can include criticism so long as you give us that five-star rating and submit it. It takes only a few seconds and it helps us out a ton in the charts. So again, Rate, review, subscribe, wherever you get your podcast, download every every episode. If you are a first-time listener, consider throwing us that permanent subscription. We are pleasantly sub-mediocre. Follow us on Twitter as well, at Hardwood Knox. You can follow us on Instagram, at Hardwood underscore Knox. We are also on YouTube, youtube.com. Search Hardwood Knox. We will come up, subscribe there. Without further delay, let's get to a deep Deep, deep dive into the Cleveland Cavaliers, the 2021-22 season, and beyond with Justin Rowan. Justin, welcome back to the Hardwood Knox podcast. Thank you so much for for the return, I guess we should call it. Uh, (laughs) We are here to talk Cleveland Cavaliers, as everyone knows by now. But first and foremost, the most important question, how the hell are you doing? I'm doing well. I I think when people think the Cavs and the return, they are going to think of my appearance on this podcast. That's probably going to be the thing that comes up to the top of their minds. It is an honor to be back. I I appreciate you having me on. It's the return and soon. Like that's you think of Justin (laughs) whenever whenever you hear those terms. You are the first person before we recorded you to get yourself hands up. You smacked your face because we're both tired. Uh, I think you're the first person to do that before the podcast. So I'm excited to see to see where this leads, given your pre-recording ritual. Yeah, I slapped in the face. I, I didn't put on the, uh, the the war paint just yet, but uh, we'll we'll see how this podcast goes. There's still time for it. So the Cavs, um, their off season was like semi-eventful. It was just mm-hmm. I, I guess I don't know what to make of their off season, and so I'm just curious as to what you're thinking about. If anything surprised you, or what what thoughts you're really harping on about their off season heading into the to the regular season. Yeah, it was certainly an interesting one. Obviously, jumping up in the lottery and getting Evan Mobley at three kicked things off, and that was exciting. Um, going into this offseason, I think one of the biggest needs was the clear lack of a backup point guard last season. Uh, they went in with Dante Exum and Matthew Del Vadova. Delhi got a concussion in the preseason. Exum got hurt right away. So you were left in a situation where uh, Damian Dotson, Broderick Thomas were kind of the primary backup point guards. Eddie Osmond played some point guard. You had times where Garland and Sexton were both out of the lineup and you had no point guards playing at all. So you got point Drummond and point McGee and all, all these other weird variations of the lineup. So getting Ricky Rubio, uh, I, I thought was a, a really, really big addition. Uh, it kind of hurts to give up one of the few wings that they had in Torian Prince, but I, I do think Rubio addresses a bigger need. And with Kevin Pangos, you, you got a, a pretty solid third string point guard, uh, obviously first team all, all year league last year, good three point shooter, good floor general. I, I, I like that addition. Um, I guess my one disappointment looking at this offseason is just 
that they were not able to really bring in an experienced wing option. Like I, I think a three, four wing uh, when Joe Ingles was reportedly on the trade market, like that was a guy that was at the top of my wish list because I, I think a playmaking wing, someone with size that can shoot, that can help be a release valve for some of the younger players, especially the guards would have been really helpful. Uh, but overall, I, I think given the lack of flexibility they had from a salary cap standpoint, they, they came away uh, pretty well uh, with this offseason. season. I, I do think that this is an improved roster. Yeah, I think it's easy to look at the holes, but you also have to look at, well, what were they supposed to do? And I, I think the Ricky Rubio addition is huge. And as you mentioned, like just having a backup point guard who can just help me, you know, maybe give some tutelage to Darius Garland, but also help with minutes with Sexton. I don't know enough about Kevin Pango, but I know enough to know he's intriguing. Mm-hmm. So I thought that was great. And then just, they weren't flat. Like what was the playmaking wing they were just supposed to go out and get? So that's right. sort of the point that you made. I, the Evan Mobley pick, is the one I harp on. I would have went personally with Scotty Barnes or um, Jalen Suggs, and that wouldn't have changed for me. That being said, I saw Evan Mobley in Summer League, and in my quest to overreact to everything Summer League, I fell in love with Evan Mobley. He was a lot better than... <laughs> and look, I only get shin deep into the draft, so my take should be ta- shouldn't even be taken seriously. That being said, how do you feel... One, how much should we expect him to play next to Jared Allen? And two, what do you think of that actual fit insofar as the Cavs are going to try to make that a a front court staple. Yeah, I was going through my old tweets about Evan Mobley, and even as far back as February, I was calling him 1B in that draft. I, I felt he and Cade were the 1A, 1B in the draft, and to land him at 3, for him to fall to the Cavs at 3, was something that really excited me. Uh, I think he's going to be the starter. I, I think uh, he, he's going to be the starter at Power Forward, um, which, I, I mean, part of that is the investment they made picking him third overall. Uh, it seems that he he's really impressed uh, in camp. He, he's a very good defensive presence, which if you're starting two six one guards with Garland and Sexton, you're going to struggle a little bit defensively. And the only way that you can really overcome that is if you have a really solid defensive front court. I, I mean, Utah is actually a great example of that because they start two guards, six, one and under. Uh, Mitchell's not exactly known for his defense, but in theory, Isaac Okoro, Evan Mobley, Jared Allen, those are defensive players that can help cover up for that. Now, what I like about starting Mobley is I I do think it actually makes the rotation a little bit easier because you can have Mobley and Sexton be kind of those first subs out of the game so that they can work more with the second unit. If you're bringing in Rubio and Laurie Markinen off the bench uh, for those two, you you have those guys playing with the starters. And then as you cycle out uh, Garland, Okoro and Allen, you can bring Mobley back in to play some center, uh, kind of play that backup five alongside with Laurie. Uh, You have, Rubio playing the point guard so Sexton can stay in his ideal off ball role. And then at the wing, you ha- kind of have a, a smorgasbord of options, whether it's Dylan Windler for shooting, Lamar Stevens for defense, uh, not Jetty Osman for whatever Jetty can bring to the table. They, there's not a lot of complete players there, uh, but you at least got a few flyers that you, you can take. So uh, I, I do expect Mobley to play a fair amount uh, this season. I, I would put it maybe like 27 minutes a night um, and split those minutes, wh- whether it's with Jared Allen and Laurie Markin. And I, I think He'll primarily be the the backup five uh, anytime Allen's off the floor. Uh, I was just laughing before she mentioned Dylan Windler, and I'm not even sure if he's a real person anymore based on how, <laughs> how little he's played since he's entered the league. But is there any concerns you have about Mobley at the four? Is it more so offensively, more so defensively? Uh, I would pay to see them run a pick and roll with Jared Allen and, and Evan Mobley, just looking at what Evan Mobley did in summer league. I just wonder when Jared Allen is the center in those units and looking at what Evan Mobley can do, on offense, if whether the the spacing sort of mucks him up there. Yeah, the, the spacing is a concern, especially when it's alongside Isaac Okoro. Um, right. Like, I, I think there's a lot of basketball IQ there. Uh, obviously, Mobley played a lot of four in college as well alongside his brother. So he, he's used to kind of that big to big passing. And I, I think there's opportunity for that to work. But when you have Isaac Okoro, who's not really a threat to, to hit a lot of threes, that can get a little bogged down. I I think we saw a little bit of that in the first preseason game against Chicago. Um, I I do think Evan Mobley is a four. 
I, I think, uh, especially early on in his career, he's most comfortable on the perimeter. I don't think he necessarily has the strength to bang low on the inside or anything like that. Um, so I, I don't have concerns with him playing the four, and I, I think it can work with Jared Allen. It's just who you have on the perimeter is going to really define whether or not that works. So uh, the absence of a real kind of proven wing option uh, at the small forward position does make me a little nervous, but you know, it's not a perfect roster. This isn't a team that's supposed to be contending. Uh, th- this is a team that probably will be outside the playing mix, but hopes to at least be in that mix uh, this season. Um, so it, you're going to have a flawed roster. It's not going to be perfect. So um, you're, you're going to make some compromises. And I, I think they are going to lean heavily on trying to be a defensive team and getting out and running when they do get stops. What did you think of the Larry marketing addition, especially knowing that it's not just adding him, paying him, but also giving up Larry Nance Jr. in the process? Yeah, I, I think I felt a little better about it after um, Nance came public and, and had mentioned that he had requested a trade, that he he had wanted to, now that they've invested in a number three overall pick at his position, he's not going to be the starter. He wasn't the starter because of Kevin Love. He finally got a chance last season, but couldn't stay healthy. Um, so it, it it, it was tough to see Larry go, but Laurie Markinen is a player that I had wanted to take a flyer on for some time. I was advocating for him at, at the trade deadline as, hey, let's let's see what you got there. I, I do think it can work out. And I the interesting thing I like about it is people are split on Evan Mobley. They don't know if he is going to be kind of that uh, AD like four where, yeah, he closes at the five, but probably plays the most of majority of his minutes at the four um so if that's the case yeah having a center like jared allen's going to help him out along a lot but as he develops if he ends up being a five and if that's the best way to optimize him having a stretch big like laurie markinen is helpful in that situation so the fact that you have invested in two bigs two different looks that you can throw alongside evan mobley to figure out what he naturally works best with i I think that's a, a really interesting dynamic to have and ultimately um you got 96 minutes between the four and five position, and that's more than enough time for those three guys as they earn those minutes. I, I don't expect them to be eating up all of those minutes or this early on. Uh, it's going to take some time with Mobley, and Laurie's not exactly a, a proven player. Um, but if things start clicking, I, I do think that there, there's a way to make sure that all of those guys are, are getting the minutes they deserve if they, in fact, end up earning them. This podcast forced me to dig deeper into this roster, obviously, and I don't hate the addition as much as I initially did. Um, part of that was Larry Nance Jr. coming out and said that he might have requested a trade. I do think this team just needs guys who can get up three-pointers at this point, and, and marketing can certainly Desperately. do that. Uh, and also, their front court rotation is just not as crowded as you think it is, unless you're just like in love with, you know, you think Kevin Jelly is going to make the roster and you're in love with him and you, you know, you're dead set on, okay, we, we need to give minutes up front to Kevin Love. So there, it's Or easy. Taco Fall. <laughs> yeah, Taco Fall. Uh, it's easy to see how they could stagger those three guys and get them plenty of playing time. Um, my two, my, I guess my one question is, do we see the, the three of them play together ever? And then have you seen anything in marketing's game that make you think he has a little bit more to offer on offense other than a floor spacer? I do think mm-hmm. he was given a short shrift in Chicago. The, I think the most experimental we saw him was actually under Jim Boylan, where they were tossing him like late shot clock grenades in the post, which has just never been his no. game. And so I'm still curious about him, but they also invested in him like, there's a lot more to see from this guy. Yeah, I think the one area that you would look at, like I, I was looking at his profile on uh, B-Ball Index, uh, shout out to those guys. And the one area that he really excelled is a, as a cutter, a, as someone off ball, he finishes really well on cuts. And this is somebody that, throughout his tenure in Chicago, never really played with a point guard. He, he has That's never <laughs> really actually had a point guard. So I, I think having him kind of it's interesting because yes he was traded for larry nance jr but in a lot of ways he's replacing what kevin love was supposed to be on this roster they they needed a stretch for someone that the guards can play off of and love was just not available for those minutes in a lot of ways evan mobley is replacing larry nance while laurie is replacing kevin love who happens to still be on the roster so that's a little awkward but that's the way that i at least think of it so I, i think if there's anywhere for him to excel offensively where he hasn't in the past it's by better utilizing him off ball as a 
cutter, um, finding ways to to get a little creative with the offense. Because let's be honest, the Cavs offense was very vanilla last season, which we're probably going to learn now that they have a few more weapons, whether that is a function of coaching or if that was a function of the personnel that was there. Because you can't exactly run a 2014 Spurs offense with Broderick Thomas, Lamar Stevens, and, and whoever else was healthy last season. So it's it's a chicken or the egg situation, but I, I do think pass or fail this season, that is going to be really, really instructive when it comes to team building for the Cavs moving forward. Slow is just right if you're on vacation, a sloth, or describing QuickBooks. More like slow books. It sucks you in and slows you down with manual processes, integration difficulties, and glitchy delays that leave you scrambling for the numbers you need. Now is the time to make the switch to NetSuite by Oracle, the number one financial system, because NetSuite gives you visibility and control of your financials, inventory, HR, e-commerce, and more. It's everything you need to grow all in one place. With NetSuite, you can automate your processes and close your books in no time, no matter how big your business grows. Failing to switch to NetSuite will leave you stuck trying to make sense of your books while your competitors sprint ahead. 93% of surveyed businesses increased visibility and control since switching to NetSuite. And right now, special financing is back. NetSuite is offering a one-of-a-kind financial program only for those ready to switch today. Head to netsuite.com slash bluewire right now. Get special financing at netsuite.com slash bluewire. One more time, netsuite.com slash bluewire. No team can afford to overpay for talent. Build a championship team with Indeed the smart way by only paying for quality candidates that meet your must-have requirements. Get started right now with a $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post at Indeed.com slash BlueWire. When hiring gets hard, you need Indeed, the job site that makes hiring incredibly simple. Just attract, interview, and hire. In fact, with Indeed, you can do all of your hiring in one place, even interviewing. Get a $75 credit at Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Indeed knows how important it is to make the most of your recruiting hours and dollars. With Indeed, you can save time and money by setting your must-have qualifications and only paying for the quality candidates that meet them. Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Offer valid through October 31st. Terms and conditions apply. I didn't throw this in the outline, essentially, but were you surprised that Jared Allen ended up getting five years and, and $100 million? No. Uh, um, I, I think when he was first traded to the Cavs, the asking price that he had with Brooklyn was five ninety, I believe. And he had really good chemistry with Darius Garland last season. And I, I just... I, I wasn't surprised to see him get the five years. Like when you can lock up a, a guy that, yeah, maybe like fringe top 10 center, like probably in that mix, if you're looking at it, just turned 23 years old, has chemistry with uh, Garland, who they're incredibly high on it and kind of have been pushing as the franchise player, um, at, at least at this point. Um, I'm, I'm not surprised to see them invest in him. Like I, I've been a big Jared Allen fan. I'm a believer in his game. Uh, so I, I wasn't surprised to, to see them lock up, lock him up and uh, get some term out of it. I think the fifth year got me. I was surprised that that it went to a fifth year, just given the big man market. I'm, I'm interested to see how it pans out, especially knowing they have Mobley now and then also invested in marketing. They also still do have Kevin Love on this roster who looked like, yeah. look, we all have probably aged a decade or two over the past couple of years. He looks like he's Boy. aged like 20 years. Um, <laughs> it didn't even look like it was a media day interview. I, I didn't even know what I was watching. What do we expect from him this season? Do you even expect him to finish the year on the roster? Finish the year on the roster... I'd probably say not. I, I would imagine that taking a reduced role, coming in off the bench, playing 12, 15, maybe 20 minutes a night, depending on whether or not he's playing well. Um, like it, it may be a way for him to help get back in shape. He he looked uh, pretty spry in preseason, which was nice to see because I actually really felt for Kevin Love last year. Like I, the outbursts, I think, cause everybody to assume he just flat out like didn't want to be in Cleveland, didn't want to play there. And uh, he's made it clear that his preference is to play somewhere else. But at the same time, last season was the closest thing to competitive basketball the Cavs have had. Like that first 
quarter of the season, they were in the playoff picture. They were playing well, and he wasn't a part of that. That was his first chance to actually be a part of meaningful basketball, and his body betrayed him after being healthy for the majority of the previous season. So I, I, I really felt for him in that sense, and now you have the Cavs investing heavily at that position with Laurie Markkinen and Evan Mobley. Um, so it... it Everything is trending towards, yeah, this, this guy isn't going to be on the Cavs long term. I just don't know what form that's going to take in the time being. Like, there is still a role for him. There, There is still a use for him while he's on the roster. It's just, is he going to buy into the, the reduced role, the reduced minutes, and help out in, in the ways that he can? So, to me, that that's a major, major question. I, I just, if I had to guess whether it's a John Wall situation where, hey, we're going to just send you home mutually agreed and if you're willing to give up money we can discuss a buyout if not we'll just play things by ear and see if there's a market when you're an expiring contract so i i don't know how that's going to play out but if i had to guess he, he's not on the roster by the end of the season i felt for him with the olympic stuff where jerry colangelo kind of threw him uh, under the bus and as and as that wanda, was tough that was a tough look and as wanda sykes said on the shop i don't know if you saw that she stared into the camera and said fuck jerry and i couldn't stop laughing i thought that was hysterical it was pretty good it was pretty damn good darius garland uh, first of all, Ooh. the Darius Garland Colin Sexton backcourt should not be as divisive as it is because there's, if you want to question like the long term viability of those two, fine together in Cleveland, but they're both really good players. And Darius Garland hit some, I was going back, like hit some ridiculous shots over the fi- final 30 games or so of the season for him. It feels like the next step for him is becoming like, I don't, I, to best describe it like the real offensive quarterback where if the defenses Mm -hmm. are set like he's just making so many plays for others making all these different reads and you've seen flashes of it i'm just curious as to um i'm curious to know whether you see that player in him does having ricky rubio there maybe help him elevate his game there at all what can we expect from him in in year three I'm incredibly high on Darius Garland like that. That has been the guy that I have the most invested in emotionally. Uh, You look at how he closed out the season that that April stretch 15 games of averaging uh, 20 and seven. That needs to be his new baseline. This season does not work if he's not assertive in that way. And the biggest thing for him has been confidence. It's okay. Are you going to take those pull up threes in transition when guys are are playing off you and you have a little bit of space? Are you taking a three? Now, he's a pass first player in a lot of ways. So it's it's figuring out that balance of, hey, if I'm aggressive in when I'm taking shots, it's going to create opportunities for other players. And if he recognizes that and internalizes that, which everything coming out of camp kind of indicates that he's at another level of his confidence and and they expect a breakout from him. If that's the case, yeah, this team could potentially compete for a plan or at least be in that mix where you get to the trade deadline and you say, hey, we're a little better than we expected. This young group is playing well enough that we're close to the plan and maybe we can evaluate being buyers. We can consolidate some of this talent, get some established players in here. Um, so it, to me, the the biggest X factor for the season is how good Darius Garland is. If, if that 20 and seven becomes his new baseline, they're going to be good. If not, you're going to have to answer a lot of tough questions, both from a, a coaching and personnel standpoint. What makes Colin Sexton such a divisive player? Colin Sexton is a divisive player because at his age, he is putting up numbers offensively that are very comparable to like a Donovan Mitchell. Uh, They are more points more efficiently than Jamal Murray, but the team success isn't there. The impact isn't there. Uh, Early in his tenure, when he first got drafted, like as a rookie, he was objectively terrible and the the veterans couldn't stand him. He has improved every season since then. But I I think there was some emotional baggage there, like whether it's with Larry Love or what other veterans were still there. There there was frustration from those early days. So I I, I think it's funny because people... I hate this term. I I really hate this term because it's been used in so many bad faith arguments, but the push to make him come off the bench without somebody earning that spot over him. Like nobody thinks he shouldn't be playing 32 minutes a night on this team. This team isn't talented enough to have him playing 20 minutes a night. So if you're going to start a lesser player than him to come off the bench, like it's almost like virtue signaling. Hey, we know that the, the this team needs to have a, a big shooting guard. We we need to have someone else that that at least in theory fits. When in reality, like 
he is already staggered with Garland as much as possible. Like if they're playing 32 minutes a night, that gives 16 minutes with Garland, 16 minutes without Garland. He is playing all of those second unit minutes. So I I don't understand why people get so caught up with who's starting. If someone else comes along and takes that spot from him. Yeah, absolutely. We, you can evaluate it then maybe it'll be Isaac Okoro. Uh, I, I, happen to think that he's a little more comfortable offensively at the shooting guard position. But the the fact that he puts up such great numbers, so like 24, four and a half assists last year, uh, like the average efficiency and in, uh, in a really, really terrible spacing situation, like unless people think it's harder to score when you're playing with Nikola Jokic or more talented teams, <laughs> I, I don't see why people are uh, kind of scoffing at, at the efficiency and the points he's putting up. Um, but it, it's the typical thing of shooting guard that puts up scoring numbers on a bad team. People just assume, oh, it's empty stats. Anyone can do that. Every every team in the league has someone scoring 25 points a night uh, on, on league average efficiency. Yeah. <laughs> I think I am I am a big advanced analytics person, but I do think we get to a point where let's not overthink 24 plus points while hitting 50 plus percent of your twos and 37 plus percent of your threes. Uh, that's just, those numbers are absurd. And the type of offense he plays is not like, this ball needs to be in his hands for eight seconds every single time. So if the team gets better, if the spacing gets better, you can envision his offense holding, if not being more efficient or more amplified on a better version of the team. And so right. I get if you want to view him as your best player, then yeah, there's, there's, there's some issues there. But that's not what he's supposed to be. And you mentioned we do get caught up. I, I understand like the cachet of the starting fives, but I'm, I'm with you that we get too caught up in who's actually starting. And especially on this team, it's like, are you going to start Kevin Pangos or Ricky Rubio instead? Like, who is the Jetty Osmond? Like, who are you starting instead of Colin Sexton on this team? Right. Yeah. It, it, Damian Dotson last season. Like, I, it, I, I just don't understand it. And I obviously the on off numbers aren't going to be great for him because he is being staggered, as I said. And in the past, like, they didn't have a backup point guard. I think having Ricky Rubio is going to really help him in that second unit because now he doesn't have to try to be a point guard and he can play in that secondary off ball role, which he plays better in like Garland and Sexton. They play better when they are together. And I I think that's a really important thing. Like when Garland was having his best games in April, Sexton was also playing really well. Every time Garland scored 30, Sexton would also score 30. Like these guys play well off of each other. So I, I, I do understand long-term fit concerns but like if you look at portland as an example where they went wrong was cashing in on the wrong players they didn't consolidate talent in at the right times they they traded first round picks for the wrong players the issue they made wasn't trading away cj mccollum while he was still on his rookie deal because you're concerned about the long-term fit it was not trading cj mccollum after he had kind of established himself after you've brushed up against the ceiling and you've seen the limitations and basically doing what toronto did they tried lowry and derozan for a long time once that hit a ceiling you moved derozan and other pieces to get an established star to get a better fit that's in my eyes, that's what you do right now. With if you're the Cavs, you you try this combination to see how well it works, and if you hit a ceiling or if you find another combination that works better, go to it, use that. But for the time being, you play your most talented players the most minutes. That's just the way you do this when you are a, a team that's been in the lottery the last few years. And there has to be the market to get that upgrade to where Portland probably had a chance. Like it, should they have rolled the dice when Paul George and Kawhi Leonard were way back when, even though they were flight risks using yes. CJ McCollum. Yeah. Yes. But <laughs> yes. <that opportunity, laughs> very much so. <laughs> one Cleveland isn't good enough to, to make that decision a no brainer in my opinion, but that opportunity, unless you think it's Ben Simmons hasn't exactly come along. And it's also easier to make that move when Colin Sexton's on his next deal. I guess my main question is though, with all that said, what would be like the path to these two guys being the future in the backcourt? Is it something one or both of them have to prove, or is it more about how Cleveland is fleshing out the roster around them? I think it's the roster around them. Like in theory, if Evan Mobley develops a reliable three point shot, and if Isaac Okoro can be a reliable three point shooter as well, like 
that should be enough defense around them because Garland's actually a pretty decent positional defender. It's the combination of those two defensively that leads to a lot of issues. But if you have the right pieces around them and the right supplemental talent, it can work. Like we we do have examples of short guards working, whether it's Lowry and Van Vliet, whether it's Conley and Mitchell, um, like the, the Portland, even Portland's a, a good example. Like if you had better players around those two, um, I, I think you, you could have had more success than they've had but um i i really do think long term it's okay do you put the right pieces around them if not is moving one of them your best path to get better pieces like if brandon ingram hit the market uh this past summer and you could move sexton nance maybe picks uh for ingram and all of a sudden you're starting garland okoro ingram mobley and allen this team makes more sense like if if something like that is available yeah absolutely you have to look at all options but for now nothing like that seems to be available and i i mean ben simmons is the biggest name on the market but i i can't see a viable path to the Cavs getting him and it creates even more fit concerns like I, there would be a lot of fit issues if you've got Mobley Allen and Ben Simmons right. like, I, I don't know how that works out Sim- Simmons has played with two centers and a power forward before and it wasn't exactly the best experience yeah if, if the Cavs end up with a Ben Simmons uh it, I, there'll be a third fourth fifth team involved I feel like and I'll also just be flabbergasted if it happens <laughs> I would still peg Colin Sexton is the most underrated player on this team because of the scale at which he's doing things. I just don't, it, it shouldn't incite that much doubt that we've seen. I think Isaac Okoro is second though. Uh, I don't know why people seem so down on him. I automatically believe, well, this would be my guess. We see someone with a shaky jumper and we're just like, Phew, not, not as valuable as he needs to be. What he did defensively as a rookie was just absolutely monstrous. And then just looking at him on offense, the flashes he showed of being able to get to the basket. It seems like he moves pretty well off the ball. I'm officially intrigued by what he's mm-hmm. going to become offensively long term. And I saw that JB Bickerstaff mentioned putting him on the ball even mm-hmm. more. Do you think that that's the path to actually optimizing him on offense? I, I do think so. He he looks a little more comfortable with the ball in his hands, which kind of blends into why I said earlier, I, I think long term, he's probably most comfortable offensively as a shooting guard. Um but yeah, like he, he's someone that works so damn hard too. Like that that was one kind of consistent thread with who these cats have drafted the last couple of years. It's all guys that have been with Team USA, Kobe Altman, Team USA connection there. Uh, all of them have reputations of being really hard workers. They're they're uh, kind of small city, small town guys for the most part. Uh, and, and they had relationships with each other off the floor. Like uh, Sexton and Okoro were friends before. Uh, Garland's got a relationship with Windler. He's got a relationship with Allen. Like all these guys kind of know each other, right? So I, I think you, you're betting on kind of that internal chemistry and whatnot. And what that means for Okoro, like I, I think this season – you might not see him being the primary initiator, but if the ball swings around to the weak side and he's able to run like a side pick and roll with Mobley or something like that, like I, I do think getting him those reps or reps with the second unit um, can help kind of accentuate that part of his offensive game. Cause I, I do think that he's a, a smart player. He, he's someone that makes the right pass, makes the right reads. Um, he, he's a good finisher around the rim. Um, if his offense was as good as his defense was last year, and you just kind of flip the offense and defense, I think he would have got a lot more credit than he uh, received for his rookie season. But I, I do think that he's someone that has really, really high potential. And uh, we, we talked about Nance earlier. He had done an interview in the preseason after working out with Okoro where he's like, yeah, I, I think he's got the most potential of the guys that were already here. Like he, he's really, really high on him. I'm not that high on Okoro, uh, but I, I do think that he can be a, a really, really solid piece for this team moving forward. I hope that they're able to sort of run these four out lineups around him, which would make me more interested on him offensively. I don't know what that looks like. It's probably a Garland, Sexton, maybe Mobley, Markinen, like those four around him. I don't know if that's something they try. Um, when you look at this team, it feels like they have their, let's say like seven players. You have the starting lineup and then you have Markinen and Ricky Rubio. How do you sort of see the rotation shaking out beyond those top seven? Unless I'm completely off on the starting lineup and you think it's going to be something different than Okoro, Sexton, Garland, Mobley, and, and Allen. No, you're you're completely bang on. And uh, 
I mean, in the first preseason game, your your first subs were Rubio and Markinen off the bench. And I, I think that's probably the most likely way for this to go. Uh, I think the only really change you could potentially see the starting lineup is Laurie in there at the starting four. Uh, if they decide, hey, we need a little more spacing, we're going to bring Mobley along a little slower if things aren't working out. But I think it's going to take some time before they get to that decision. And what Mobley can already do defensively is incredible. Like, he's just such a good connecting piece that get, keeping him with those starters and with that talent, I, I think there is an appeal to that. Um, but outside of that, I I don't really know. Like, I, I think Kevin Love's probably the eighth. Um, I just hope that you don't see a lot of minutes with him and Laurie Markkinen. They tried it a little bit against Chicago, but uh, my buddy Evan Damerel uh, did some reporting there where he, he was saying, hey, don't read into the rotations in the, the preseason. They are experimenting. I think people forget sometimes preseason basketball is just an extension of training camp. It's not necessarily right. the the plan you're going into the season with. Uh, but yeah, I, I think Kevin Love will play some minutes. I think Jetty Osman um, may, might be maybe the, the ninth man. The ninth and tenth man, uh, there's a competition petition for that. JB Bickerstaff has said that he wants to go in with a 10 man rotation. And I, I think it'll between be between uh Dylan Windler, Jetty Osmond, Lamar Stevens, primarily uh to fill out those last two spots, if I had to guess. I don't even want to name them all because of how, how many there are. I did list some of them in the outline, but like who do you want to actually make this roster when you're looking at all those partial guarantees? Who do you want to see more of moving forward? I assume that you have to default to Dylan Windler, who's not partially guaranteed, but just like what the hell is Dylan Windler? That's just the question we've been asking for for years at this point. <laughs> like theoretical Dylan Windler may, is a perfect fit for what they need. A 6'7 long arm wing that rebounds well, that makes the right passes, that can shoot really well, shot the hell out of the ball in college. Uh, like he, he even like if you look at his like january and february last year he's shooting 40 percent from the 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 line uh he's rebounding well he he was playing pretty decent team defense he just can't stay healthy like outside of that from the non-guaranteed guys i really like what dean wade brings to the table i don't think there's a role for him until kevin love is off the roster uh but i I do think like as a third power forward yeah he's someone that moves his feet well defensively that can shoot well plays good team basketball again they need smart players out there uh, to to help make up for how young they are uh so he's someone that i would give a nod to lamar stevens is someone that i have a soft spot for i think there might be a path to playing him in some of those bench lineups if it's laurie markin and mobley uh sexton rubio like i i think if there's enough shooting out there he's someone that can kind of excel as a slasher and, and a defensive player uh they had a good ability to score in college but not a lot of that came from the outside which is obviously complicated when you're talking about this team um denzel valentine uh chris fedor from cleveland.com did report he's kind of a break glass in case of emergency presence on this team doesn't really anticipate him being part of the rotation so uh if you're looking at guys that could potentially work out well i think it's dylan windler and jetty osman as those backup threes just because of their theoretical ability to shoot the basketball like but prior to last season, Jetty Osman, like 2019, 20 Jetty makes a big difference for this team because he's someone that can at least handle the ball a little bit shot like 37 percent from three. He just never really adjusted to coming in off the bench. So that that's a real, real big question mark because some guys just aren't comfortable in that role. And uh, if that's the case for Jetty, he's going to have a tough time sticking around in the NBA. <laughs> Do we expect um, Kevin Pangos to be one of like their top 10 guys? If it's a, you know, they might go beyond a 10 man rotation, but do we expect him to be within the top 10? I, I don't think so. I, okay. I, I think when you look at Garland, Sexton, and Rubio, it, it's similar to the front court situation with Allen, Mobley, and Laurie. There's 96 minutes between those two guard spots. And if Sexton and Garland are playing 32, Rubio is probably going to get 25. That leaves maybe seven uh, for Isaac Okoro to slide over or maybe Dylan Windler or something like that. I, I just don't see a role for Kevin Pangos uh, in the regular rotation. Injuries may open things up, um, but I, I just I, I don't see a, a path to him being uh, at least for the start of the season. I, I don't see a path for him uh, unless maybe Rubio gets traded at the deadline or there's some injuries. You sort of alluded to this already, but what is the biggest weakness on this roster, whether it's a specific position or just a a functional archetype? Yeah, um, you may have heard this before, but when LeBron James isn't on the roster, 
they have had a bit of a hole at the small forward position. That is <laughs> like, a spicy take. Yeah. That is spicy. It, it, it has been a bit of a trend. Uh, we, we've seen Alonzo G, CJ Miles, uh, Jetty Osman there the, the, the last, uh, I guess now almost eight years um, with, with the four-year break when LeBron came back in, in between. Uh, yeah, finding small forwards is tricky. Like I, I think the Cavs were hopeful that they could add someone with the mid-level exception. Uh, guys like Doug McDermott and, and other wing options kind of were outside their price range. They tried for Josh Hart. That didn't work out, which undersized wing, but it, at least would have helped fill a role. Um, it, it just didn't work out. So now you're really relying on Isaac Okoro and a bunch of unproven players uh, to kind of play that small forward position. So that, to me, is the clearest hole on this roster. I normally try to go through teams and just figure out where I think they're going to end like top, whatever on, on offense and defensive efficiency, and just try to figure out which end of the floor they're going to be better at. This team gave me a headache when I started to think about it. Um, <laughs> do you have any predictions for where you think they might end on offense defense or where you think they're just going to be the, the better team? I think it would naturally be, Oh, they're going to be the better offensive team. But then I look at like their starting lineup and you do have Rubio. And if Mobley's actually good defensively off the bat, you have Allen. Look at how good Okora was last year. He's going mm-hmm. to be better. I could see them technically outplaying their their offense on defense. I think so too. Like if you look at last season and exclude May, where there was basically nobody actually playing, the things were falling apart, lottery odds were improving. Uh, you do the math there. Uh, outside of May, they were 21st uh, defensively, which for a team as young as they are, and that only really got like 17 games out of Nance before he got hurt, like that that's kind of where they hung their hat and and the fact that now you got ricky rubio in there instead of dotson and broderick thomas like i I think that's going to help them out a lot defensively that everyone else is a year older you got a full year of jared allen Uh, i think defense is probably going to be their best end on the floor i don't think they're going to excel in any one area Uh, i think when you look at a starting lineup that has an average age of just over 21 you are probably going to have a lot of nights where things don't go your way. I I think this team isn't going to be as good as their best nights, and they're not going to be as bad as their worst nights, but you're going to get a really, really uneven performance uh, over the course of a season when you are this young. So if I had to guess, uh, just based on personnel, as well as the tendencies of the coaching staff with J.B. Bickerstaff, uh, I would assume that defense would probably be their strongest end on the floor, but not exactly excelling in any one area. This is always subject to change based on how the season plays out. But if you had to pick right now, who would be the player most likely to be dealt before the trade deadline this year? I would say Ricky Rubio uh, in the final year of an expiring contract. I, I do think there would likely be a market for him. If they see enough out of Kevin Pangos um, to say, hey, maybe he can be a backup point guard or, or uh, if other options become available, maybe there is some appetite if things are going well uh, to use Rubio to be that chip that you go out and buy at the trade deadline to add a wing um, for a contending team that maybe needs a, a point guard, right? Like, I, I think there, there's going to be a market for Rubio. And if you're attaching other assets along with him, yeah, may, maybe you can make a, a little bit of a splash there. Uh, so he he would probably be my pick for most likely. And just because in either direction, like if things go really well and he's their chip to buy, yeah, he makes a lot of sense. If things go really poorly, he can be an, a, a chip to add another asset to maybe try this again next offseason. So uh, to, to me, he makes the most sense. But at the same time, I really like what Ricky Rubio can bring to this roster. Like, I, I think from a, a veteran standpoint, you need to have adults in the locker room. Uh, he, he's been a mentor to a, a lot of good young players in the league, and I, I think he's going to do the same thing for Garland and Sexton. So uh, my preference would be to keep him around, but he'd probably be my pick for most likely to be traded. I think when you look at the Cavs front court, their crunch time lineup might change more than most, depending on the <laughs> matchup. But what would be, what do you think will be or should be their their best crunch time unit? Oh, boy. That is really tough. So I I do think Garland and Allen would probably be my locks. Uh, I would say Okoro, too, just because they have a lot of faith in him. They have a lot of trust in in what he can bring to the table. So outside of that, it's 
Mobley or Laurie and maybe Sexton. Like I, I think Sexton will probably be out there because a lot of crunch time situations for the Cavs are probably them looking to make up ground and take the lead. I don't think they're necessarily going to be protecting the lead a whole lot. So you probably are going to have Sexton out there. And then it's just a matter of whether or not it's Laurie or Mobley. And that might be, you know, who, who's playing at power forward in crunch time might just be a result of who's playing the best that night. Like if it's a great night for Kevin Love, Maybe it's him. If it's a great night for Laurie, maybe it's him. If if Mobley's playing well, it'll be him. Like I, I, I do think you're in a situation where, yeah, they, this isn't the deepest team in the league, but at the same time, they do have depth at the same position, like whether it's the bigs or the guards. So there's going to be internal competition on a night-to-night basis on, on who gets to close. And I think that's overall a pretty healthy environment for a young team, uh, as long as there's enough minutes for everybody, which I believe there will be. Is there a quirky outside the box lineup that you're hoping this team tries at some point during the regular season? I wouldn't hate to see a Garland, Okoro, Windler, Laurie, Mobley lineup. I I just think, you know, there's spacing there. You can get a little taste of Mobley at the five. I I think uh, that two man game with Garland and Mobley with those spacers around them would be a lot of fun. And and even Okoro, uh, he he might be able to initiate some offense there with Garland playing off ball. So uh, I do think that that's kind of a a fun lineup. But I want to see this team get out and run. And I I know that's going to cause a lot of turnovers and a lot of mistakes with the young team, but I just want to see some up-tempo basketball. So I I think that's a lineup that is well-suited to do that. So no, no four center lineup for you with Kevin Love, (laughs) Moby, Markin, and Jared out. No, no, that, uh, (laughs) that is not exactly the direction I'd like to see them go. I don't think this is quirky enough, but I want to see the, the, the all kids lineup. I'll call it just Garland, Sexton, Okoro, Dylan Windler, and Evan Mobley. Like, give me those five just to see. I'm sure there'll be a lot of mistakes, but that's technically, you know, four out around Okoro, depending on how Mobley is, is shooting. So see, I you said all kids, but then you pick Windler who is older like, than Laurie Markin. Yeah. <laughs> just cause I haven't seen Windler. He's still a prospect to me. I just haven't seen enough. There you go. Him. So he, he, he's like Duncan Robinson. Look, look at the, their, their age 24 seasons, almost identical, just didn't do anything. And he's about to have that breakout. I wish that was true. I really wish I could lie to myself in that way. I I'm hopeful though. Cause he, he's someone that when he is healthy, he like, he seems like a smart basketball player. He seems like he would fit. It's just this poor guy can't stay healthy, which was never the problem before he came to the NBA, which is really unfortunate. Look, I think I told you this last year when we were talking about Dylan Windler, what his role might look like if he stays healthy uh someone retweeted into my timeline of someone else calling dylan Dylan Winler the caucasian jimmy butler and so that's that's clearly the prospect that you have on your hands uh if you're wondering that is a wild wild comp (laughs) uh that it's certainly a hill to die on too thought it was bizarre Uh, they're over under as we record this win total is 24.5 are you taking the over under on that and where do you see them sort of stacking up relative to the larger picture of the east yeah, so I I mean, I bet the over when it was 26 and a half. It looks like I uh, jumped at the wrong time, and that's been bet down a little bit. I, I Right now, I'd probably rank them about 11th in the East. Um, I, I think uh, they're going to be better than Orlando and Detroit. Uh, Toronto is a really interesting situation because they were in the play and mix last season and didn't really have an interest in that. Um, I will be interested to see like if they want to go for it this season, that's a team that can easily make the plan. Uh, but if Masai decides to pull the plug again, that might create an opportunity. Uh, Charlotte is really good and I like their long term outlook, but they got younger. And, and I, I think they're going to have a lot of growing pains this season. So I, I think they're right around where Charlotte is, at least in my eyes, in the Eastern Conference. So you, you look at last year, they won 22 games uh, in a 72 game season, which works out to about 25. I think they were better than their record last season. And uh, I, I do think that they did improve. So I probably have them low to mid 30s uh, if you're looking at this season. Their place in the East is tough. Because I, like you, think Orlando and Detroit are the only teams that are definitively better than. You do have teams like Washington and Toronto where what if they? What if Washington trades Bradley Beal? What if Toronto decides, no, we don't want to finish 6, 7, 8. Like, we're going to punt on this season again midway through. Right. I also don't know. I know they looked good in their first preseason game. I don't know what the fuck the Chicago Bulls are. I just, I don't know what's going to happen there. So I could see them imploding. I could also see them being fourth and then... I think the comp you made was great was where Charlotte is like the team that I've thought about. Maybe Cleveland is like that, that third team Cleveland is definitely better than 
it feels like people are sort of rushing expectations upon them because Lamelo yeah. was so good and their roster just didn't get a lot better over the off season. And now you're putting a ton of expectations on what's still a, a relatively young core. When you look at PJ Washington, miles bridges, uh, Lamelo, you lose Devonte Graham, you bring in Kelly Oubre Jr. There's just a lot of weird stuff there, but the East yeah, is so and book Knight's probably going to like take over a lot of Graham's role rookie you got kai jones as the backup center i I think going to Plumlee is a downgrade from cody zeller like it they've they've got questions on the inside and i i really like their long-term outlook i'm a big fan of what they've done i like the players they've drafted it's just similar situation to the Cavs. they're they're young they're they're young they're inexperienced they got younger you're going to have growing pains there um I, i really think whichever team is better is probably going to be determined by whoever is better between Garland and LaMelo. Like you, you see like point guards are real floor raisers in the game. So um, I, I do think that that's probably going to be what defines the season. Like if Garland in order for this season to be successful, Garland needs to kind of establish himself in like that LaMelo ball, John Morant tier of point guards. If he doesn't do that, things aren't going to work out. Like it, it's to me, it's almost that simple when it comes to the Cavs. You mentioned this team maybe buying or selling at the deadline, depending on where they are. What does selling look like for them? Is it just moving Ricky Rubio? Because when you look at the raw, I mean, you would trade Kevin Love, but Kevin Love isn't readily tradable. Otherwise, he would have been moved already. So what would selling actually look like with this roster? Is it just a Rubio move? Yeah, I I think it's Rubio. I mean, there's not a lot of other veterans on this team. Um, I I think the core six is probably safe for this season. Um, we'll, we'll see what happens with a, a Sexton extension. Uh, if he gets locked up, obviously that removes him from a lot of train conversations. Um, I, I think Garland and Mobley are probably the closest things to locks with this core. Um, and then outside of that, you get to a Coro, Jared Allen, they just invested in. So I, I don't see them parting ways there. So I, I don't really see a whole lot of shakeups with kind of the, let's call them the young core, the core six, whatever you want to call them. Um, I, I don't think any of those guys get moved unless it is a uh, consolidation, uh, like a, a situation where you are moving two guys from that kind of core six to add another. Like to, to me, that's how I define core. Like, I, I don't think all these guys are franchise players. I think core can change from year to year, but a, a core is basically guys you're only moving if you're bringing in a piece you believe can be part of your future core. Uh, so that's how I would kind of identify those six outside of that. Jetty Osman, Ricky Rubio, Kevin Love, like those type of guys would, would be moved if I had to guess who could be traded. And do you think the front office has the gall slash sense of urgency to make a consolidation trade if one presents itself, knowing that the Cavs, they're not, we just talked about it, they're not in this defined position in the East. And so I would think that makes such a decision harder to make. I think uh, I think they've taken a pretty patient approach. Like even this media day, a lot of the players were talking about playoffs as a goal, playoffs as a goal. Um, Kobe Altman came out and said, hey, we, we have an eye towards the postseason, but this is a process. We're not going to put a number of wins on it. I Things can always change with the Cavs. I, I, I mean, ownership ha- has become impatient at times. Like I, I wouldn't be surprised if there was a shakeup if they didn't live up to expectations. But those de- expectations haven't really been firmly defined. And the fact that they're not outright saying, hey, it's playoffs or bust um, makes me believe that, hey, they understand that we're starting a lineup that is incredibly young. We didn't have a lot of uh, cap space to make moves around this team and, and supplement the talent. So we tried the best that we could, and now we're going to get a better sense of where these young guys are at. So um, I, I don't necessarily think there's going to be a panic move, but you never know. It, the sense of urgency in the NBA and, and that timeline with teams has seemed like it's moved up the last couple of years. Is there anyone or anything about this team I haven't asked you about that you think needs to be discussed? Ooh, you are thorough, my friend. You are absolutely thorough. I, I don't believe there's a whole lot uh, that has been left uncovered. I, I think uh, a lot of my preseason thoughts are, are out there now. So uh, I, I think I think we've covered this team pretty damn well. Just no strong taco fall opinions. Nothing, nothing on this. He he is going to be great for the Cleveland charge. Uh, <laughs> I, I think uh, he, he is going to be a fan favorite there. You know, Taco's an interesting guy because he seems so beloved in locker rooms that maybe you keep him around as a good vibes guy. Uh, Kevin Gelly is a, another good vibes guy. We had uh, the opportunity to talk to him at media day and uh, was I was really impressed with what he had to say. 
Um, th- this is a team that uh, the the vibes are really good. Uh, the vibes are really good in preseason. They they seem to really like playing with each other, which I, I think is great. Um, we'll see how that works and, and how resilient that is because they are going to have a really tough opening to the season uh you you got uh, memphis charlotte atlanta before you go on a road trip playing denver both la teams portland and, and uh a big west coast uh swing right off the bat so we'll see how resilient that is but uh it, it is nice to to have a situation where the vibes are good you got a, a young core that likes playing with one another and they're going to test out to see what they're uh what they're capable of the vibes are good. That's a great note to end the podcast on. Justin, are you able to tell our listeners where they can find you and your podcast? You will find me and my good vibes on Twitter at Cavs Anita. Uh, you can find my podcast wherever you listen to this podcast. I, I will wager that you will be able to find the Chase Down podcast. We talk about the Cavs and the rest of the NBA through our wine and gold colored glasses. I, I like to call it realistic optimism. Like I, I got people excited last year about the Cavs predicting 27 wins. Right now I'm saying they're probably 11 seed, like mid 30 wins, low to mid 30 wins. And you know what? If I can convince people that that is an intriguing storyline and get them excited about it, you know what? I'm doing my job well, so uh, you can find me there. You say rose-colored glasses, but I am impressed with how you and Carter have kept level-headed takes, and it, you haven't. Your opinions on the team have not skewed in any different direction since you guys have been under the actual Cleveland Cavaliers umbrella, which is an impressive accomplishment to fall under that umbrella. But then to also, you know, still give your actual opinions on the team without fault, without you know. Everyone is going to have the best season of their career. They, they've gained 10 pounds oh, of muscle, God. lost double digit percentage of body fat off there. And so. every, everybody that needed to lose weight, lost 15, everyone that needed to gain weight, gained 15, you know, like it, I, I think it helped that we were already doing like a, a, what I believe to be like a fairly fair podcast. Like I, I always want to be realistic, but at the same time, like this is sports. Like I recognize that this is escapism. I've always kept that in perspective. So I'm not going to be the fan that's sitting here screaming for so-and-so to be fired because I, my strength, what I know is how little I actually know. And and that's a real benefit when it comes to talking about sports, because at the end of the day, like there's so much that we don't know. I keep things in perspective and uh, try to have some fun along the way, because you know what? Like life's too short. And at the end of the day, it's NBA basketball, man. Like it, it's not a life or death situation. That's what I've said. I recognize that what I do is completely expendable. I take my work seriously, but I also don't take myself too seriously. It's a fucking oh, God, game that we no. cover. At oh, the end God, of the day. no. God, no, I can uh, me taking myself seriously. No, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, I followed but, you on Twitter for more than half a decade. You definitely do not take yourself too seriously. No, a- absolutely not. And uh, hopefully I facilitate good enough conversation. And you know what? We bring on the experts. We bring on the experts and we have some fun with them. Get them to loosen up. And, and that's the best way to go about it. Well, please keep up the great work. Thank you so much for coming on. As usual, I'm glad we have a third term to associate with you now. Soon, the return. And I think my favorite one now, the vibes are good. Uh, Justin, I think as you know by now, I'll be pestering you again in the future. Thank you again. No problem. You can pester me anytime. Thanks for having me. Sign up for WinBet Sportsbook at wynnbet.com today using promo code BLUEWIRE to get up to $1,000 toward a risk-free sports bet. Offer subject to change, terms, and conditions at winbet.com. Must be 21 or older and present in the state where play-through WinBet is available. If you or someone you know has a gambling problem, call 1-800-522-4700.